today we will have the pleasure of listening to, to Mar Reitan. So before introducing Mar, let me first talk a little bit about the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis. So the Society was founded early 2007 by the Benefit Cost Analysis Center at the Evans School of Public Affairs in the University of Washington. The mission of SDCA is to dedicate to the advancement, the exchange of ideas, research, and uh, other topics related to benefit cost analysis, cost effectiveness analysis, risk benefit analysis, and applied welfare economic analysis. Now, usually the, the conference or typically SBCA has an annual conference and its meetings held in Washington and has done so since 2008. Now that um, in order to have it closer to home in Europe, the society decided to open up uh, a conference in Europe. And its first SBCA uh, European conference was organized by TAC in 2019. And this year we're gonna organize the second SBCA conference in 2022. That is to be held in November three and four in Paris. So this is going to be an in-person conference and it's gonna be hosted by Paris School of Economics. Now you are still on time to submit your abstract. So the deadline is on June 15th and the available information is here on the slides but we will add those, um, those links for you to have in the chat. Now, for more information about the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis and its journal, uh, you can also you will, you can find that information in the link that we're also going to provide in the in the slide, in the chat as well. Now, in, to complement the European conference, uh, we decided to provide this um, webinar, uh, and this is a, a joint event that is organized with the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis and TSC, which is an event hosted by TSC. And this is the, the second of uh, our, our webinar series. The first one took place last year with uh, Professor Sir Parta Dasgupta as speaker and Professor Johan Rockstrom as discussant. If you'd like to have more information uh, and you would like to uh, have access to the streaming, it is available online. Again, the link will be provided to you on the chat as well. Now, this is a joint effort uh, of what I think we don't, we haven't still found out uh, a better name for us yet, but we call ourselves the SBCA European Task Force. So this is the, the fruits of our discussions with Henrik Anderson at Toulouse School of Economics, with Susan Chilton at Newcastle University, with Massimo Florio at the University of Milan, with Berg Christom at SLU Umea and Emil Kini at Paris School of Economics. We would like to extend a special thanks to the team at TSE and also to Stephanie Risser of the foundation of Jean-Jacques Lafont for making the event happen. So thank you very much. Now, just to give you a, a, a small outline of what I'm going to do right now, I'm gonna first introduce Mar uh, and her, the topic of her paper. But the way that this, uh, this uh, webinar is organized is that we're gonna provide uh, a space after Mar's presentation for Q&A. So the idea is for you to share your questions uh, in the Q&A feature and for you to vote on the questions that you find more interesting. Now, the webinar will be recorded and available on the TSE's uh, YouTube channel. Now, Mar, um, she has an impressive career. Now, she holds an associate professor position at Northwestern University. Uh, she is a member of uh, the NBER Research Associate and also the CPEPR Research as an affiliate. Now, her research, which is published in top journals, um, uses high frequency data to study the impact of auction design and environmental regulation on electricity markets and energy intensive industries. And as an expert in the field, she is currently editor or associate editor on top economic journals, such as Review of Economic Studies, the RAND Journal of Economics, and uh, and many others. <laughs> so in addition to her contributions to the literature on energy and environmental economics, she also has produced influential policy reports dealing with climate change, oils and subsidies, and emissions market. She was awarded a National Science Foundation career grant in 2015, the Sabadell Prize for Research 
for economic research in 2017. And since September 2021, she has an ERC project looking at the impacts of energy transition. Now, the aim of her ERC is to understand the impacts of energy transition and to foster more resilient electricity markets. Now, the key challenges of her energy transition, of the energy transition uh, that are presented to the energy sector is with twofold. First, the decarbonize, decarbonization leading to a reduction in these emissions. And second, climate change adaptation that greatly impacts the electricity grid. Now, today, Mar will present a paper looking at the interactions between renewable expansions, new transmission networks, and the electricity market focusing on the expansion of the transmission grid in Chile. Now, her work is entitled The Value of Infrastructure and Market Integration, Evidence from Renewable Expansion in Chile. And without further ado, I give the floor to Mar. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I will share my screen now and then we'll get started. Uh, let's see, share my screen uh, here, uh, here. And I'll bring it to the beginning because it will be better than the end. Um, let's see. So thank you so much for having me here. This is actually a paper that is at its heart a case the study of a cost benefit analysis. So when you invited me to come here, I was like, yes, I actually have something that will be perfect uh, for, for cost benefit. So in this paper, we try to measure the impacts of a transmission line expansion in Chile that as many of you might be aware of, um, transmission expansion is very tricky because of not in my backyard uh, concerns, but it's extremely necessary to bring renewables where the demand is and to continue this decarbonization that Daniel was talking about. So uh, the goal of this project, again, is to quantify the benefits and the costs of this, of this expansion that, that has already happened in Chile, and in the process reflect a little bit about the methodologies and as we use them in this context. Uh, if you hear a bit of background noise, I am putting solar panels at home today. <laughs> so there might be some uh, solar panel interruptions, okay? But they are for, for greater good. So, uh, so here you can see uh, the challenge that we have. Again, I, I imagine many of you came to this talk a little bit already selected into the topic, but we do need to massively reduce and basically bring to zero our emissions. Electricity and heating are a big contributor to, to, to greenhouse gas emissions and to climate change. Although if you notice, it's one of the few sectors that's improving a little bit, like a little bit. This should go to zero. So we are a long way far from where we should be. But at the very least in the electricity sector, we've been making a little bit of progress. And that little bit of progress, a lot of it has come from um, from renewable power. The other bit has come from uh, LEDs and other um, energy efficiency innovations. So today we'll be thinking about, okay, how do we move to renewables and faster? And a big constraint there can be uh, the network. So the electricity grid was built around uh, city centers. So if we need to bring a lot of power to Paris, we will need lots of lines that go into Paris. And they have been designed over the many years to connect power plants with consumers. Now, as we start putting renewables, renewables are not necessarily where the lines had historically been placed. And it's natural that at the same time that we expand renewables, we need to, we need to build more lines. Again, in Europe, building lines is very complicated because they often go through someone's house. It's densely populated. In other areas, it can be also uh, political. In the United States, for example, it's a big nightmare anytime you have to cross the state lines because every state can say uh, their opinion and then it can be very tricky. In Chile, uh, there is this situation that a lot of the population lives in Santiago and a lot of the solar power that has the best class is in the Atacama Desert. So there was a big push to connect the Atacama Desert with the city center, as well as to the mining regions in the north. I'll show you a couple more maps. Um, the good thing is that in Chile, that, that expansion uh, was feasible and it received enough political support. At the end, we will talk about what a consumer is better or worse off with this line expansion and I'll come with positive news. This was a welfare uh, improving uh, expansion. 
So when there is no good connection, when the network doesn't expand, um, there are two problems. One is that it could be that there is uh, solar power and there are solar panels, but we need to curtail the power available that we have. This has happened a couple of times during the spring in Spain, for example. There was more solar power than, than, than demand. And the connection with France was at its limit. So at that point, you need to throw away solar power. This is what we call Cordillaman. Obviously, from an efficiency point of view, it's inefficient because it would have been much better in the middle of the crisis that Spain could have sent more power to, to, to France. Uh, on top of that, um, this depresses local prices. So during these events, there were many people in the media that were putting a map of Spain and France and showing that the price in Spain was almost zero, but the price in France was still very high, given the high natural gas prices that we have. So these two effects that are kind of immediate effects of having little uh, transmission uh, connection have an additional dynamic effect which is that they discourage uh, the investment in new solar panels. So solar panels in Spain are very economical. There's lots of solar resources available. But on the other hand, if there is no better connection to France, what's the point of building them? This is what was happening in the Atacama Desert. The Atacama Desert, as you may imagine, is to first order not populated. So there's basically no population with demand, but there's plenty of supply. But in the absence of a transmission line, we will be uh, disincentivizing. We will not have these dynamic benefits, these investment benefits. I already mentioned this, but expansion of the grid is crucially important. In the United States, it's a big part of Biden's proposal, uh, the infrastructure deal. Although, as you know, if you follow US politics, <laughs> Let's see how much of it can go through, but at the very least, it is a plan to, to greatly expand transmission in Europe uh, and even more with a crisis. There's been several statements of improving the connectivity between countries in Europe and in Chile, as already mentioned, they already did two very significant expansions in 2017 and 2019, which is the, these are the ones that we will be, that we will be studying. So our case study can be useful also about thinking about how to communicate the benefits and the cost of these lines, because again, they tend to be highly, highly controversial. Uh, good development there from the technology point of view is that more and more these lines can be built with direct current instead of alternate current. And direct current lines can go underwater. So this has facilitated some of the discussion, some of the not in my backyard kind of limitations, but still uh, communicating properly the gains and the costs of placing these lines is important. So this is Santiago. We will be bringing power to Santiago from the middle of the desert. Here you can see the scale of, of some of these solar panels. And this is a pretty high level. And you can already see the the, the panels here, if we get a closer look, these are massive solar installations that are connected uh, with, uh, again, the city center of Santiago through a thousand of kilometers line, a 1500 kilometer line. Additionally, I already mentioned these lines are also connecting to the north where there are um, copper mining. So this is the map before integration. And you can see this dark blue in Atacama. These were uh, zero prices in Atacama. So in Atacama, there was a lot of solar. It was the pressing prices. Prices were zero. And it couldn't go to the north, where the mining region is. In fact, before 2017, these were two completely separate electricity markets. There was not even a tiny connection. And it could kind of go to the south, but very quickly, it became congested. So you can see it kept some low prices here in La Serena, Coquimbo, but then very clearly, uh, quickly, the, the transmission line was not enough to, 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 to trade. So there was a lot of trade restrictions. Um, after the connection, um, what they did is in the first connection in 2017, the north and the south became connected. But the connection with Santiago was still pretty poor. And then in 2019, they beefed up the connection with Santiago. To be fair, the connection with Santiago already existed. It was just very small, okay? 
because again, historically, the network was built to serve where power, where uh, people consumption is, and Atacama had barely anyone. So there was barely any network uh, in Atacama. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but as you may understand, there was very limited connection. Um, so what I will do is tell you uh, more about this, um, uh, about the, the Chile and what we find. But before I'll do a bit detour to talk about the theory on how to quantify the costs and benefits of the line. And the main emphasis that I will put on the theory is to highlight that if we do a very narrow event study around the time in which they build the line, we might miss many of the benefits. Then I'll tell you more about Chile and I'll show you our numbers. I will separate between the static analysis and the dynamic analysis. The static analysis will be more like the event study type analysis that looks at a narrow window. And the dynamic analysis will try to get at the more long run effects of the line. In particular, the fact that many solar panels were built, but they were not necessarily built right around the window that the transmission line happened. Uh, I will show you how it then in, uh, this kind of difference can impact cost benefit analysis. So uh, here I put some related literature. It's nice that Jan Tirol is in the related literature. There's been a lot of theory on the benefits of transmission lines, sometimes emphasizing gains from trade only, oftentimes also emphasizing competition benefits. Firms are more competitive if you have a, a bigger market. And in the case of uh, electricity, a bigger market means a better connected uh, network. There's also been some work uh, highlighting the efficiency gains from enhanced transmission. And some of it, again, is focused on market power. Some of it is more purely focused on gains from trade. And then there have been also some papers looking at the environmental impacts of transmission expansion. Ours is, um, fits right into this literature with this case study of uh, Chile. So on the theoretical framework, I kind of already uh, gave you the, the goal of this theoretical framework that I will present. It's kind of, uh, my goal is to convince you that an event study might not capture the full impact of the transmission expansion. And therefore me, we might wanna use a broader set of tools to quantify the benefits of the line. So um, actually from a more big picture point of view, uh, uh, transmission expansion is the perfect event study a scenario because literally you know that the grid operator doesn't have the line and then one morning they wake up and the line appears so from an event study point of view usually you see a big jump in the effects of uh, building a line because literally there is one day in which they turn it on and if you look before and after the day before the day after you should see things going very differently so there is a lot of power and a lot of information in that event study but it typically captures the static effects. Given the power plants that are in the grid, what's the difference one day before, one day after? You should see big change. However, it does miss a little bit the dynamic impacts. And in our case, it, it might miss the fact that the solar panels get built. Why? Because whereas the transmission line becomes available the exact day that they are planning to, the solar panels keep getting built and they do not exactly coincide with the event study. So it might be much, much fuzzier. And in the case of Chile, actually several, several years fuzzy. The solar panels got installed one or two years before the line uh, became available. So if we only look at the narrow event study, we will miss all those dynamic benefits. In a picture, you can see it here. This is a very simple picture, trade 101 picture without demand effects. So demand in the north is fixed, demand in the south is fixed. And we're trying to decide who produces what. If the north is separate from the south, we will be in outer key. The north will have a cheaper power because they have solar power. The prices will be lower and the south will have higher prices. And obviously there will be some inefficiencies. Uh, in the presence of trade, we have all these gains from trade. We produce more in the north and we send it to the south until the prices converge. So this is in a static sense what happens when you turn on the line. From the day before to the day after, you see all of these gains happening and it's very clear in the data. What might be missing? Well, oftentimes when the line comes online, it's announced several years before. 
and companies start planning in advance. So in the case of Chile, there was a lot of solar investment that happened before the line. So when we do the before and after, we are no longer comparing the line I showed you before. We are comparing this very cheap line to the, to the costs in the south. So if we do a before and after, then we will get these very low prices in the north. These are those zero prices I was showing you in Atacama. And it will look like the transmission line is really helping prices to converge because there were zero prices in Atacama and now they go to something positive. So we will find these static gains from trade that might be bigger. However, we might be underestimating some gains from trade that are coming through the investment channel. All these solar investment would not have happened in the absence of the line. And this is what we will try to quantify by combining the more static effect that gets at this triangle of the gains from trade with a dynamic model that will tell us how much solar investment occurred in Chile thanks to, thanks to the transmission line. So this is what we will try to do empirically. Um, and I think this is more or less what I already showed you. In the paper, we have this very simple theory model to put it in a more formal way. But the results that we have is that the static event will tend to understate the gross cost savings. It will tend to uh, understate the overall price reductions, but it might overstate price convergence, how far off prices were and how, how they converge. So we will, again, use both the event study and structural estimation to get at these different effects and, and quantify this dynamic uh, benefit. So let me tell you a bit more about Chile. I already told you a lot, but just to show you again the map, in 2017, we will be connecting the north uh, with the central system that were completely separate before. This, by the way, is very interesting from a political economy point of view. The north is a mining region, and traditionally it had no interest to connect with the, the, the south because there was the big demand center there. So it was better for them to be kind of separate and isolated. But as solar power came available, then uh, the mining region had an interest to connect with Atacama, which was on the other side of the system. So this is how historically we do connect these two systems that were um, traditionally separate. And then in 2019, there was what we call this, we call the interconnection because they were not connected before. 2019, we have this reinforcement event. The line between Atacama and Santiago already existed, but it got very significantly reinforced. So in terms of announcement, and this is important for the dynamic benefits that I was commenting, it was announced way earlier than it was connected. It was announced in 2014, construction became in 2015. There were a little bit of delays. And then finally, November 2017 is when we turn it on, when we see this start of this uh, double circuit of uh, 500 kilowatts, kilovolts. Um, and the capacity, you can see it's sizable, this uh, 1500, it's about three, three coal power plants or one and a half nuclear power plants. So for Chile, this is a, a substantial amount of power. Um, and then 2019, also announced before, eventually the reinforcement gets completed. Uh, some more background about Chile. So in Chile, it's, it's, it's a market that works a lot like uh, France, I would say. So it's... Um, kind of centralized market where the firms bid and the central operator clears the market, but uh, the, uh, the plants are not free to bid whatever they want. Their bids are cost-based. So the regulator can kind of uh, audit and keeps track of the costs of the inputs. And then basically they control the bids that the firms are making in the market. So it's similar to Europe in terms of the mechanics, the firms submit bids and every day they decide who will be producing uh, the central operator. But with the difference that the bids that the firm submit are more, more scrutinized. Importantly for our purpose, this mechanism was the same before and after. The only difference is that the, when the central operator was solving the problem, all of a sudden they had much more transmission available so they could bring power much further away. Uh, so this is, in some ways, the only mechanism that happened during our events, the, on, the only change uh, in, in, around the events. So the data we have, similar to other electricity markets, is very rich. 
So Chile is in general the paradise for data in general. <laughs> and in the case of electricity markets, we also have very good data. We observe basically what's happening at every hour of the day. We will know the costs of the power plants as a as they submit into the market. We will know demand at every node, which is basically a dot in the network. There are over a thousand nodes in Chile, but for our purposes, we will work in a much more, much more simplified network model. We know prices, we know the emissions, we know the plant characteristics. So we really know a lot about what's happening every hour. And this is the data that we will use uh, for, for our analytics. So let's start with a static analysis. We will uh, construct uh, basically um, cost measures to see, to ask the very simple question of did costs go down in line with gains from trade when the transmission line got started? And we will have these two events, the 2017 event and the 2019 event. I for interconnection, R for reinforcement. So um, the, the, the line on top of reducing costs also made prices to converge. We do not have it in regression form, but I want to show you some of the graphs. And indeed, you can see a lot of price convergence. So prices were around here. And then in the interconnection, this is around the border. You can already see that prices at the border con converged after the interconnection. If we look at the whole market, including Santiago, the whole thing, prices did not necessarily converge. They tended to be uh, cheaper in the north, more expensive in the south. But eventually, with the reinforcement, you can think of Chile becoming a more or less unique market. This is not to minimize the fact that there are still some hot spots around Santiago. But in general, this type of transmission expansion was enough to make prices on average quite similar across regions and much more than, than before. So we have these full price conversions after the reinforcement. And we have some price conversions in the interconnection, especially around the border. So all of these should come out as uh, gains from trade. So uh, you have here the more visual uh, picture, but you can see here prices being very different, prices converging a bit, and then prices converging much more over time. Although again, there are still some hot spots. So in order to look at costs, we will take advantage of the fact that the, the bids from the power plants are regulated, and we will treat the bids from the power plants as the costs of their inputs. And we will calculate the average cost of power at every hour of the day in our sample. So this is a time series where the Y variable is how much does it cost on average to produce one megawatt hour at a given point in time. Then we will regress this onto the interconnection event and the reinforcement event. And we will add a bunch of controls and fixed effects. The most important control that I want to talk about is this C star. Actually, it should be a C star and a script T. So this is a cost measure that also changes over time. We follow a very interesting paper from Steve Sikala in 2022 to construct this variable. This is like a control variable approach in which we construct a cost measure based on the ideal dispatch of Chile. So by ideal, I mean, imagine you had no constraints and, uh, as, and you could use power plants any way you wanted without any network constraints. What would be the cheapest way of producing power? By construction, C star will be smaller than CT, but very related to CT. Why is this control important? Electricity markets are a complicated object that depends a lot on commodity prices, the prices of coal, the prices of natural gas, and the availability of hydropower, which in Chile plays an important role. So by constructing this ideal C, we can control non-linearly for many of the changes that there are during this period. During this period, there was a severe drought. They, there were dramatic changes on commodity prices. So without this control, the event study could capture many of these changes that are happening coincidentally over this period. So we find in our simulations uh, uh, that this is a very important control and that it works very well. I can show you later. That said, alpha three is not our 
coefficient of interest. If you are interested, alpha three is basically equal to one. <laughs> So it's a very similar with regression to regressing CT minus C star. So in some ways, you can think of this event study as measuring, thanks to the interconnection, thanks to the reinforcement, how much closer do we get to this ideal cost measure that we know we cannot attain. So looking at the uh, regression results, uh, you can see the one I was telling you on the costs of uh, ideal costs. Um, if we look at the effect of an interconnection, we can see that it lowered the cost of electricity by 1.72 uh, um, dollars per megawatt hour, and the reinforcement lowered it an additional 1.12. So uh, we have a reduction of about three dollars per megawatt hour at noon, which is the hour in which there is more solar. But we also have a general reduction of about two dollars. Um, these are not uh, huge, but it's basically, if you look at here, the, the cost of electricity is about a 5% reduction in the costs of electricity. So these are static event studies suggest that there are gains to the interconnection, but they might be missing some, um, some, some additional gains that come from dynamic investments. So this is in line with the theory in which we said, okay, we might be understating the gross benefits from the line if we don't take into account that solar panels are investments are made feasible thanks to the line. This bias will be particularly important if the investments do not happen at the same time as the line. If the, if the investments happen exactly when the line is constructed, then it is not confounded. But here, as we, show, as we show in this picture, we see that uh, there was a lot of anticipation in this market. So this red line that you see uh, going up so quickly, it's solar power in Chile. And you can see the dramatic increase that's already happening before the interconnection. So these solar panels got built way before the transmission line happened. So many panels were built that the price in Atacama, which is this green solid line at the bottom, was almost zero already starting in 2016, but it only got back to positive after the interconnection. So we treat this as potential anticipation, but we don't know how much of this is anticipation. So we will build a structural model to basically ask ourselves how much of this increase in solar power was thanks to the interconnection, the anticipation that the interconnection would happen. And this way we can attribute some of this investment to the lines. So this is what we will do in the, I will uh, skip this a little bit. Uh, we also look at exit by the way of power plants and we do find that some of them exit uh, when the line is built. Interestingly, for exiting, you don't need to build anything. So we do find quite a little, of, uh, quite a little bit of coincidental exit. Some power plants exit exactly the day that the transmission uh, happens. This is more of an administrative procedure. Probably they were not used way before then, way before then. Um, the exit that we find is by thermal plants that were already rarely used before, before solar uh, entered the market. So now we will do this. We will try to build a, a dynamic model so that we can quantify how much of this anticipation is thanks to the line uh, so that we can consider it in the cost-benefit analysis. So to do this, we built a pretty standard engineering-like model of the Chilean electricity market, although for engineering purposes, it is very, very simple. So as I already told you, Chile has a lot of data available. And among the data available that they have, they literally have the mathematical program that the central operator uses every day to clear the market. The central operator program is about a million and a half lines of code that describe the market of Chile. Our model of Chile will have about 200 lines. So it will be a very, very simplified version of what the Chilean market looks like. The nice thing about Chile is that it's a bit like Mozambique. It's very, very long and thin country. So when it comes to network models, they can become very complicated. But in our case, we will do fine with just a line. And networks that are aligned, for those of you who work in networks, are much uh, easier to handle than networks that, that have uh, a much different uh, topology. So we will build this model with five regions. Um, and then within these five regions, we will estimate the flows so that we can construct the transmission line before and after these expansions. 
Um, to do the regions, we will try to be as fancy as needed. Uh, basically, we will use some machine learning to try to find which are the prices that move together. And we will get the big price swings into the model, but we will not get local congestion. So typically around Santiago, there could be some crazy days with big price spikes. We will be missing all of that crazy congestion. We will get a good handle at regional price differences, but not so much uh, city, city level uh, congestion. So with this simple model, we will then create the demand for each zone. We will create the supply function at each zone by technology, water, gas, uh, coal, and obviously renewable power. And then we will estimate the transmission capacity between regions. We estimate the transmission capacity between regions because our network model is not the true model. So this is an opportunity for the model to better explain the data. But reassuringly, we find that the transmission expansions of our model are very much in line with the actual transmission expansion. So even though this is very simplified, it more or less captures uh, these flows, which is important for our study. So once we have this, we uh, minimize costs, which is in a sense what the central operator is doing. Again, the only difference is that our code is much, much more simple. We will minimize cost, taking into account that demand has to be equal to supply. Supply is the quantity produced minus the losses, because transmitting power across long distances does imply losses. Also within neighborhoods, there are losses. And then we will have some capacity constraints for solar panels, for coal power plants, for gas power plants. And this thing here, which is in reality a bunch of equations, it's the flow constraints. We will have some constraints on how much power can flow between these regions. Our um, events, it basically changes in this matrix. When we have an event, we allow for more trade and that will come with lower, lower costs because we relax the constraints. So when it comes to the dynamics, this is really why we went through all this headache. The dynamic model will basically solve for the optimal quantity of solar power capacity, the K. So we will be solving how much solar power we will be built in Atacama. And this will be a function of how much solar power gets produced, this is Q, and how much uh, the price is. So we will solve for the optimal K, and the thing that we will do with this model is to solve for the optimal K under different uh, flow constraints. So we will be asking how much solar power there is when the transmission line is fully available and how much solar power there is when the transmission line is not available, where they, where they don't build any of these transmission expansion. So with a smaller flows, with a smaller transmission line, we will get less power for two reasons. One, because there will be curtailment. This is what I was mentioning, that you throw away solar power. So for the same capacity, with less transmission, we will get less output. And on top of that, prices will be smaller. So these two effects will make solar investment smaller when there is a smaller transmission line. So we will compute the optimal capacity with and without transmission line and with and without the reinforcement. And this will allow us to compute these dynamic benefits. So we do uh, first two scenarios. We have the actual scenario, which is that the market becomes more integrated in 2017 and then it's reinforced in 2019. And then first of all, I will show you the all or nothing. Then we do counterfactual one where we don't have any market integration. So we don't have reinforcement, we don't have connection, but here I will not do a dynamic correction. This means that I will assume that the solar panels are still there. It's just that we're throwing away a lot of power. And in the second counterfactual, I will actually do this dynamic correction. I will ask, okay, how much solar power there is uh, if there is no market integration and then solar panels get, don't get constructed. You can see here first that our actual scenario fits quite well the data, although it does underestimate a little bit price spikes. This is what I was mentioning that our model is not very good at capturing some of the local congestion that is driving these price spikes. But overall, it's kind of fitting the time series relatively well. It will tend to understate a little bit the benefits from the expansion because we're missing the price spikes and transmission lines can help reduce price spikes, but it sort of more or less fits the data. 
Now we will compare our predicted model to these different expansions. So here you can see the actual scenario, our predicted data. And here you can see what happens if there is no transmission line, but there is a still solar power being built. What you can see is that before uh, 2017, everything looks the same by construction. And after 2017, what happens is that even though we have the same solar power, we have to throw it away. So any difference between the orange line and the green line is solar power that we are throwing away that we cannot use. Then we look at uh, what happens when uh, there is no market integration and on top of that solar panels don't get built. And you can see here that the effect is much, much bigger. Why? Because even though there are solar panels being built, we get, we get much, much fewer solar panels in the market. So uh, the point of the dynamic model will be to think about, okay, if there had been no interconnection, we actually would not be on the orange line. We would be on the blue line and therefore cost would be much higher. So here you can see the cost comparison and you can see indeed that the costs are higher when we don't have market integration and on top of that solar panels don't get built. On the contrary, if we look at no market integration, but we think that the solar panels could be built anyway, then we really underestimate the cost benefit of the line because the orange and the green line are really quite close, especially during this interim period. Uh, however, in reality, uh, those uh, solar panels wouldn't be there and in reality we would be on the blue line. So you can already see that for the cost benefit analysis, it can really matter whether you take into account the dynamic benefits or only the static benefits. So here we put it in numbers. We do find that solar generation would be much smaller. If we take into account the dynamic correction, uh, without the line, there would have been 50% less solar on average. We also find that generation costs would be uh, much, um, much, much uh, higher if we take into account the dynamic benefits. So for example, here for noon, we see that the generation costs would be 12% higher if there had been no solar power investment, um, if we don't correct for this dynamic bias. Uh, this is what I already showed. When it comes to prices, we also see that overall prices went down much more than if we just do the event study. If we do the event study, we would say prices have gone down by, from 37 to 35. However, if we take into account the dynamic benefits, prices really went down from 39 to 35. It's just that the event study, we only see the static effect. I also mentioned that we might be overstating price convergence. And indeed, this is the case. So if we look at market integration, the price differences between Santiago and Atacama are very small. If we look without market integration, but we keep all those solar cheap panels, we get that price difference would be huge. However, without the transmission line, price differences would remain, but they would be much smaller. So this is kind of, again, uh, emphasizing the result number three in the paper, which is that we might be overstating price convergence, but for anything else, we are understating the benefits of the line. So we will now try to think, okay, can we correct our event study? Can we run an event study in which we correct these uh, dynamic confounders? And here we'll be doing something a little bit funny. Let's see what you think. So we want to go back to running an event study, but we want to create a synthetic event study, an artificial kind of event study, where we make solar investment happen exactly when the line is built. So for that, what we will do is try to ask ourselves, okay, what would happen if only the interconnection line was built? And we will get how much solar investment will jump in that first event. And then we will ask, okay, and what's the benefit of the additional reinforcement? And we will get the additional jump in investment. We will then create a time series in which solar investment basically jumps at the same time as the event. And we will rerun the event study regressions to see uh, how much of a bias this can uh, represent. To be honest, once you have the counterfactual model, you really don't need to run this corrected event study, but it's kind of a useful tool to assess the potential bias in the event study.
So here we will have the event study for the interconnection and the reinforcement. And here, this is the basic one where I don't do any correction. And this is the one in which we have the correction. And you can see that the events can double or even more than double when we take into account the dynamic benefits. Why? In the corrected time series, solar power investment based on the structural model would only be 30% before the interconnection and would only be 70% between the interconnection and the reinforcement. So the reinforcement, when the reinforcement line is built, not only do we have the static gains from trade, on top of that, solar investment jumps by 30%. And when the interconnection is built, not only we get the north and the south to be connected, on top of that, we get 50% increase in solar investment. So um, you can also see that our event study is similar to the counterfactual simulations. So in these uh, numbers here, I do a proper um, div in div in some ways. I use the whole time series of the counterfactual and the whole time series of the actual investment to create the difference in costs. And you can see that these two are very uh, similar. I want to highlight this because it, it emphasizes whether these event study is working or not. And for example, when we were not using uh, the national ideal cost as a control, the one that I mentioned as methodologically important, we were finding that these event studies were extremely biased. And we would get something very different if we used a full simulation-based approach compared to an event study. So in some sense, this, this last comparison is giving validity, validity to the event study itself. So this is what I wanted to present for how we get the numbers. Now I'm going to get to the cost benefit part that I was very excited to share here because uh, all the, you, uh, you call it uh, benefit cost analysis, I, uh, but other than that. Uh, so um, we have more or less the numbers. I've shown you that the transmission line reduced costs. I've showed you it made prices to converge. So now it's kind of comparing it to the investment costs and see what we find. So this was uh, sold as a, a big benefit to consumers. And indeed, the costs of the lines were paid by consumers. So it was about $860 million and $1,000 million for the two lines. And these were, again, passed through to consumers. So consumers have to pay $860 and $1,000. So for the cost benefit, on the benefit side, we focus on consumer surplus because consumers are the ones who paid for the line. So we will be asking where consumers better off with this line is the benefits that they got from the line higher than, than what they paid for. We also have a full cost benefit analysis. In the full cost benefit analysis, we find that the, the line was still well for improving, although uh, there were some big losers, which are the, the coal producers and the natural gas producers, kind of the traditional producers. Uh, that's kind of a bit of the goal of the policy <laughs> to replace uh, traditional production with renewable power. So they were uh, big losers, uh, but we still find that the overall cost benefit is positive. But again, for the presentation, I'll focus on consumer surplus. So were consumers better off or not to justify them paying for the lines? So for the benefits, I already told you it's mostly reduced costs from solar power. When it comes to the costs, we need to account for the cost of the lines and also for the cost of building the solar panels. The solar panels didn't fall from Earth. So we will take into account the cost of the solar panels and the cost of the lines, and we will compare it to, um, to the benefits, the cost reductions. This is what we find without a dynamic correction is the top line, orange line. And here, what I showed you is the discount rate and the number of years it takes to recover the transmission investment. So in Chile, their um, official government discount rate is 5.83, very high. So this is not kind of an environmental discount factor, but just the one that the government uses. Um, so you can, you can pick a much smaller number and then you will definitely find uh, that the cost benefit passes. But for investment purposes, that's the one the government of Chile uses. So let's say around 6%. And you can see that without taking into account the dynamic benefits, the line uh, takes about 25 years to be paid. So you could still make the case that consumers are better off, 
but in government sometimes 25 years is a very long time so if we take into account the dynamic correction then the benefits get recovered much much faster in less than 10 years and if on top of that we take into account the environmental benefits both from a climate change point of view but also from local emissions from coal burning and natural gas burning we do find that the lines paid by themselves very quickly even at a high uh, discount factor. So um, this is kind of the cost benefit. As I mentioned, we also do the cost benefit when we include the losses that the producers made. And what we find is that the coal power plant producers were not very happy about this, but overall the line, uh, the costs of the line are still recovered in less than 20 years. In the case, by the way, in the case of full welfare analysis, when you worry about the co-producers, then obviously the environmental justification is more important than in this case, in which you don't even need the environmental justification to make this attractive. So uh, let me uh, conclude, and this way we have uh, time for questions. I see I went very quickly without questions, so we will have a lot of time for questions. I'm happy to clarify anything that I have explained. So in this project, basically, we first presented some very simple theory to highlight why there might be static and dynamic impacts for market integration. I, we highlighted that the standard event study that looks very nice in this kind of data might not capture the full effect. So we did a structural model to capture the full effect using detailed data from the electricity Chilean market. We do think that this type of analysis can be useful because it's very important from a communication point of view when these grid expansions are discussed to be able to tell consumers the benefits and to be able to expose to quantify them. So we hope that, that this can be a, a helpful uh, case study. When it comes to empirical findings, we do find that the lines were instrumental in, in bringing solar power. We don't find 100%, so some solar power would have been built anyway, but the lines really enabled the solar market to, to flourish. And we do find reduced costs. They might not be huge, but 5% uh, reduction in costs and 12% reduction in the hours of most demand can be significant in these markets and even more in the face of uh, climate change. So with the environmental benefits, it becomes a, a no-brainer. So I will leave it here. It is a bit early, so I hope uh, we can get a good, a good discussion. Mark, thank you very much for this very nice presentation. So while we have questions that are going to be written in the Q&A, um, so Livo Weifleinen, uh, uh, has one question that relates to on how should one think on adjustments through demand. And he gives us an example, for example, lower prices in Spain than in France are gonna lead to industrial investments in Spain. Yeah, that is a very good question. This is a channel that we completely ignore. So if we had that as an additional benefit, it would probably make the transmission line even more attractive. In the case of Chile, we have been looking a little bit into the centers of manufacturers to see what we can find. The Chilean industry structure, as I understand it, is very much driven by the copper industry. And this definitely is a, a very good news for them. Chile traditionally had had extremely expensive power and all of a sudden they have all these available power so uh, it can the same way that the line um, was beneficial to consumers it also can be a good industrial stimulus i agree it we will underestimate all of these benefits in part because we don't know which elasticity to use and we did not have a good handle of it but uh, it might also take a bit longer to show up. Maybe thinking back to the event study question, this would be even harder to pick up in a, in a very narrow event study. But I think there are other ways in which to measure it. Maybe with, again, annual census of manufacturer data could be one. Yeah. Mar, maybe, maybe an extension to that question would be from, from your paper and from your findings, like what can we learn from, for the European electricity markets? So I think there are things we can learn and things that we will need to do better than here. So for example, in Chile, this was a no-brainer. 
again, the mining region had been separate from the big demand centers because it was politically a bit tricky. Um, the mining industry needed cheap power and connecting it with Santiago made it a bit tricky. But with solar power, it became a no brainer because solar power was in the middle. There was no one in the middle. So no one is upset about the prices in Atacama going up <laughs> and the mining region is good and Santiago is good. So everyone's happy. So this is kind of an ideal situation in which to justify these investments. Now, one risk that we face in Europe and there was a bit of that rhetoric with the crisis is that, well, when you connect to regions, typically everyone gains on average, but some regions uh, are winners and some regions might be losers. So if we think about cheap solar power in Spain, um, some people might be like, why don't we just keep it for ourselves? <laughs> you know? So all of a sudden you enter a discussion that can be a bit difficult given the, the situation now in Europe and well, the many political challenges that we're facing. I do think you need to convey in a much better way what are the costs, what are the benefits, and on top of that, potentially, what is the cost allocation? Who will pay for the line? Who's benefiting from the line? So we might run into much more detailed discussions of winners and losers than here. Again, we didn't do much because it's not very, not very juicy. But I think in Europe, we will have to have that conversation and, and again, communicate well why we are connecting, because it's already hard because people don't want the lines because they are high voltage and they destroy the landscape. And on top of that, their prices might be going up. So it's gonna be a bit, uh, I, I think we need to do better on identifying winners and losers and working on that kind of the communication of the cost benefit and maybe the cost allocation. Yeah. In Chile, was there a discussion on the winners and losers? The so again, the line. losers were not um, not not very much there. I believe there were some important discussions on whether the lines were going through protected territories or uh, native territories. So there are some discussions that need to be made. But and there were some. My understanding is that there were some provisions, for example, to compensate for, let's say, um, native uh, tribal lands and things like this. But uh, in the bigger picture, this is uh, very few people compared to the whole of uh, Chile. So it was uh, easy to find a bit of an agreement in some ways. Um, in Europe, we are talking about very densely populated areas. So through the Pyrenees, Catalonia and the south of France had been trying to connect for 20 years with a 100 kilometer line. It took forever, uh, maybe 25 years. Um, so it is much harder when it's much more densely populated. In Chile, the bigger discussion was whether the solar power producers were to pay for the line or the consumers were to pay for the line. So consumers paid for the lines and in a sense it is kind of a subsidy to solar production. But because Chile is such an expensive market and there were a lot of gains to have, it was still politically viable because consumers were still better off, even if they paid for the lines, which is in a sense a bit of a subsidy to solar production. In other places or other situations, it's the producers who pay for the who pay for the cost of the line. Yeah. So we have we have a question by Alice Mevel. So she says, "Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation." So how generally desirable are your findings to other contexts and to what and what socioeconomic or institutional factors are key to ensuring that these types of grid expansions are welfare enhancing? And she gives the example existence uh, and quality of renewable industry to respond to grid extensions. Mm -hmm. Yes, so from a more uh, Econ point of view, uh, cost benefit analysis point of view, abstracting away from the renewable context, I think a big takeaway is to be a bit careful with the event studies that we might be missing a little bit, even if the event study looks very nice. So that's kind of the bigger takeaway that I think it's applicable possibly in quite a few settings. When it comes to renewable power, um, let's say, um, 
it is it. so this is already done when they plan the lines they try to think okay where is the good wind where is the good solar which lines make sense but maybe um i think the part that's not generalizable is how easy it was in chile what i was mentioning right now but in general i do think that whenever you do these things it's very important to quantify the dynamic uh, channel and possibly ex ante one possibility is to combine a grid expansion with an auction. So you have a transmission line that you want to build, and then you do an auction for renewable power coupled with a transmission line. That would be a more geographically based uh, auction than we typically see. Typically, we see a solar auction in Spain or a solar auction in, in Portugal. But there could be more specialized auctions that are attached to the location of the line. And then the bidding could or could not include the cost of the line. Again, these are all kind of decisions to be made, but you could have an auction in which the solar producers uh, are bidding, understanding that they will have to pay for the line and that can help understand um, is the line sustainable even from a pure business point of view? And this auction would just help with the coordination of building a line. Or does the line need a bit of a subsidization where the consumers pay for the line? So if the auction doesn't clear, if there's no one offering in the auction, well, you might need to go back to the drawing table and be like, okay, this line does not look just economical. Can we justify the environmental benefits via other benefits to, to consumers? So that could be quite generalizable. Thanks, Mark. So I have a question actually concerning the, the structural model that you that you have in your paper. So I find it's, a, it's an excellent contribution and on, on top of the fact of suggesting that this event study actually doesn't provide all the full benefits. Right? Could you say a little bit more about the role that structural models uh, have within cost benefit analysis? Yes, no, I, I think so. Initially in our project, we we were only planning on doing the event study, if I can be 100% honest. <laughs> but then we started to see that we were missing something quite big. And that's when we brought in the, the structural model. I think it can be helpful. I would not recommend it on its own only. So this I haven't emphasized much, but I did mention that our structural model, let me show you underestimates some of the price volatility that is part of the data. So when we do our structural calculations, um, we are probably making the transmission line less useful than it was because we're missing many of these price spikes. So, but I think in combination, it can be very useful. So we get some benefits by doing the more traditional event study. Then we do the structural model. We do show that we understate a little bit uh, prices and therefore we understate a little bit um, the, the benefits from the line, but we do show that the dynamic channel multiplies by two or by three the benefits. So it brings you back to the more reduced form estimate and it puts it in context. Okay, we have the reduced form estimate, it gives us some benefits. The structural model doesn't quite match it, it's not perfect but it's telling us that the dynamic effect can multiply by two or by three the, the, the effects that we observe in the data. So it can be kind of a combination. If the two approaches were giving me very different answers, I would be concerned, to be honest. But here we find similar answers, but it's true that quantitatively, one is better getting at the volatility that our model doesn't reflect, and our model is better getting at these dynamic effects that in the event study it's impossible to, to simulate. So this is kind of maybe one way to think about the benefits of combining the two. I often combine the two because if I do a very complicated structural model that gives me something that it's really hard to believe, then I don't feel comfortable either. So I try to combine the two being aware that not, nothing is perfect, uh, but but more is probably better. That's kind of my, <laughs> my approach to, to this, yeah. Great, thank you very much. So in, in, in the motivation mainly was to, was to integrate this anticipation effect 
But could you tell me a little bit more about um, why why were the solar panels built with so much anticipation? Yeah, that is a question we always get. So let me put it again because the anticipation is really massive. So some of it would have happened anyway, by the way. So some of this is not necessarily anticipation. We find that 30% of this would have happened anyway. But a big reason for anticipation is um, that there is, um, when you build a line, you need to get a permission to connect to the line. And it's kind of a bit of a queue system. So oftentimes you want to, what in English we would call call dips. You want to call dips on the line. You want to make sure they save you a spot. And the way to do it is to build the solar panels and request for a connection. So oftentimes uh, we find that uh, in these projects, uh, people try to anticipate the line so that when the line comes online, uh, you actually can, can connect your solar panels. Some way to put it, if, um, if many, many panels uh, came online uh, at the same time, it could be that some of them, basically it could be that you overbuilt solar panels and some of them are already not able to connect. So it's kind of a way to coordinate the expansion and this way you don't get too many panels uh, in the wrong spot. So it's not uncommon. It's also true that the builders of the solar panels themselves did not lose money. So uh, these are companies that were uh, willing to offer them uh, what we would call a PPA, a power purchase agreement. So even though the price in Atacama was zero, the solar panels were not paid zero. Um, a utility, a power company was paying them a fixed price on their solar output, but someone was anticipating. The solar panels got paid, but whoever bought the power from the solar panels was not getting much out of it until 2017. So typically it's not the solar builder itself, like a small solar manufacturer that's taking the risk, but some bigger utility that's already getting all these power purchase agreements getting the solar panel built, getting the connection request ready so that when the line comes online, they already have all their solar and they can keep kind of growing. Yes. Um, a lot of these also like uh, in Chile, there was a, a mandate to have solar power like in many other countries. The difference in Chile is that the mandate is not binding. There is more renewables than, than by mandate because Chile is very expensive. So it's really not a, it, it, it's really economical to put solar panels in Chile. You don't need any subsidy to put solar panels. So the minute that it was clear that it would be feasible, it was economical. So people started jumping in. Yeah. So you also, thank you very much for, for that answer, um, Mar. So you also mentioned at some point when constructing your structural model that the, the regulators in Chile, they have their own model, right? So you talk about a million or so codes of line. Yes. So, <laughs> as compared to your to your 200. So I was wondering like, to what extent, like if you were to have say, for example, access to that code, would you be able to replicate exactly what the, the prices are uh, in that? Yeah, so our initial idea was to use that code which is available at least for a part of the sample. So um, you can run it in Cplex. I don't know if you have ever used Cplex. Um, it's a Orgurovi, a, a mathematical programming solver for mixed integer uh, programs. You can read the model and you can solve it. It does take forever to solve one day. So you have to, um, not forever, but compared to our model, obviously it takes much, much longer. Um, uh, so it takes several minutes uh, to solve one single day. And that was our initial idea. The problem is that when there is the first, we don't observe the mathematical model before the interconnection. So it would be difficult to do the before and after year. But we thought, well, maybe we can kind of construct it or something, but it is such a complicated code. And then on top of that, what happens is that modifying a network model, when it's such a complicated network model with so many lines, it is something that is not easy. So modifying the code to have one line less is not trivial because many of these models of uh, the network are already approximated. So there are all these coefficients that are approximated based on the network. 
So if you want to change the network, there are all these coefficients that you would need to change to, to be able to simulate it. We thought, no problem, we will use the code right before, right after, and we will see the many coefficients that they changed, and then we can actually put it back in. The problem is that with the reinforcement, they changed the, the names of all of the constraints in the model. So it was impossible to see which lines we would need to compare. And remember, these are millions of lines, many of them, they are not, it's not that they have a huge manual. I'm sure they do, but we don't have that manual. So eventually it became impossible because they changed so many names in the constraints. That, that we, couldn't, we couldn't get a good idea on what to modify. And we thought, okay, we will do something way simpler, but at least we will know it's correct. So that was kind of the thinking. But for a while we, we were poking at that thing. It was just too complex, to be honest, for us to, to properly process. Um, I guess an alternative would have been to directly collaborate with them, but, but it would be a lot of work for them. And yeah, I'm not sure we would have managed. The, the, the reason I ask is because when, when you're constructing the counterfactuals, well, like to what extent you're gonna, do you know like that the equilibrium that is gonna come out is the, the equilibrium that is gonna be played at, at the counterfactual, right? So my guess is that in this sort of markets, you don't have that issue in the sense that you will know what would be the equilibrium on the counterfactual. So is, is that correct, Mar? So the most important thing is to do apples to apples. So when I was showing you all of our results on the cost benefit, uh, this thing, for example, um, this is not comparing the data with our model. It's comparing the model with our model. So then at least you know in the model, what's the impact of considering dynamic effects versus not considering dynamic effects? Well, it doubles the benefits of the line. But this is within the model. If I compare this, the data to, to our model, then the potential mismatch is quite big. So I always recommend my students to do first, compare your data to the model, and then compare your model to whatever you are studying. But comparing the data to whatever you are studying, there's that big gap of your model not being perfect. And here we can see it. For example, uh, here we can see that the benefits of the line are $2 per megawatt hour when I don't take into account the dynamic benefits. In the data, they are actually measured to be more around three than two. So our um, model is missing some of the benefits. It doesn't matter too much because the line, as we estimated, is already very profitable. So it doesn't affect the bottom line that the line in a cost benefit point of view was clearly a benefit. But if we didn't find that, then it could make a big difference. So I, I try to keep in mind the bias of the model when I make the conclusions, because if I think that bias can change the conclusions, then I think I would have to explain it in a much more different way. Uh, yeah. So our model is underestimating the benefit of the line. It just so happens that the line is still highly profitable. So, uh, but if the lines were a bit different, then I think it would be much more important to be, I think the, the most natural next step would be to make the model more realistic so that we could get closer to the data. That could be a natural step. I don't think in this case would change the bottom line too much because the line is already a benefit. But if these were different, then I would be much more concerned on the conclusions because the bias would go in the opposite direction of what I'm saying. Yeah, in this case, the bias goes into making the line even more, even more profitable. Yes. Thanks, Mar. And one thing that I find pretty, pretty interesting of what you mentioned before is this combination between uh, event studies and structural models. Like, how, how would you actually use those two in order to inform policy decision making? Like, would it be constructing some bounds or just some lower bounds? Yes, uh, let me think about the bounds. So, um... Um, I did have a bounce thing in that paper. Um, um, and there are some assumptions. Um, and there are some assumptions we show 
that the um, so if there is no no bias or anything this is um the um, the static results that we found before which was about three three dollars in total are a lower bound to the gross benefits and here when we do the dynamic correction we find that indeed it's bigger it's bigger than three right when we do the dynamic correction although it's true that when we do the static one we find it lower it should be around three if everything were perfect but we do find that the static is a lower bound on the gross benefits. Under some assumptions, it's also an upper bound on the net benefits. What does the net benefit mean? That if you take into account the cost of the solar panels, you still have as an upper bound that much surplus. So that we could use for this part of the analysis. The static event study provides an upper bound on the benefits, on the net benefits of the under some assumptions, yeah. So that, that we haven't exploited too much and we could combine it much more explicitly here for now in the cost benefit, we only use the, the structural model, but the static analysis does provide some natural bounds for this part as well. And I should go back and compute them because we haven't done that, yes. Thanks a lot, Mar. So I think we don't have any more questions on the chat. So I suggest, that does anyone have any further questions that we can ask to, to Mar? Okay. Yeah, so otherwise I wanted to thank you, Daniel, you, and I wanted to thank you and Alice also for the questions. No, no, it's my pleasure. I think I find the, the paper to be extremely interesting, extremely useful, and I think it's a, it's a novel application for benefit cost analysis, the combination of a structural model in order to inform policy decision makers. I think it's, it's worthwhile doing, and you manage to compare what would be the difference between just using an event study as opposed to uh, using a structural benefit, a structural model as well. So I think it's extremely valuable to, to the literature. So without further ado, I really thanks. Thank you a lot, Mar, for this great presentation. Thank you very much all for your participation to this uh, webinar. So you will find the recording back again in the YouTube channel of TSC. And thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs>